Pippin Pharmaceuticals in association with Higher Secondary Principals Forum. Hello students, a pleasant morning to all the viewers of this sociology virtual lecture. I am teacher Bambina from Jawaharlal Nehru Higher Secondary School, Fatoda, Margaon. Well students, you have already learned about different social institutions like the caste system and the family in chapter number three, that is social institutions continuity and change. Today, we are going to learn about market as a social institution. We all know that market usually is called as an economic institution. But here in this lesson, students, we are going to learn about how market is a social institution. Students, I have got some pictures, images of some markets. First, we have the image of a market complex or a shopping complex where the sale is done over the counter. We actually go and buy things from these places. Then on the other side, we have here the Amazon or the other markets. Those are called as virtual markets. We do it online. We don't have to visit those places. So these are called as the virtual markets. Then up there we have the stock markets where stocks or shares are bought and sold. Years back students, people used to actually go to the stock market or the stock exchange to buy and sell their stock or their shares. But now we don't have to actually go to these stock exchanges. It's all done on the click of the mouse. Online, people buy gold, sell gold, just online, in virtual form, not in physical form. So these were the images of markets. Now let us understand in simple terms what is market. For a common person like you and me, a market is usually an area or a place where people go and buy things. We say a fish market or a vegetable market or some will say the panjim market or someone will say I'm going to the marga fish market and so on. But from economic point of view, market need not necessarily mean an area where people actually go to buy or sell their products. It is how far a particular product has got a demand for a particular thing. Like take for example, a local bread or the pound which we sell, the bread men sell, will have a smaller market compared to bread like Spencer's or uh, Monjani's and so on. We even have the virtual markets which I have already shown you all students where we don't actually have to go to those places to buy or sell our products. So these days students, we even have a big market for geo routers or laptops or Android phones. This is all because of our online classes, isn't it? So market basically means an area of transaction or an area of business. Now we shall move on to our important topic that is sociological perspective on markets and economy. Here we shall see the difference between a sociological perspective on markets and the economic perspective on markets. First we shall see the economic perspective on markets. When we think of economic perspective, we think of this famous personality, Adam Smith. Now this famous political economist, Adam Smith, in his book, The Wealth of the Nation, said that market economy is made up of series of individual exchanges or transactions. He speaks about something called as invisible hand. Now let us see what this invisible hand is according to Adam Smith. He says that each individual looks 
only to his own self-interest. And in the pursuit of the self-interest, the interest of all or of the entire society is taken care of. I'll explain this with the help of a simple example. Let me give the example of myself. Me, as a teacher, has got my own self-interest. And what is that self-interest, students? Maybe I have taken up teaching because I love teaching, or maybe because I will get money. But in the bargain, what happens is the interest of the students also is taken care of. Now, Smith says that there is some sort of unseen force at work which converts what is good for each individual into what is good for the entire society. So this unseen force, according to Adam Smith, is called as invisible hand. Now, Smith says that society benefits when individuals pursue their self-interest in the market because it stimulates the economy and creates more wealth. When we have our own self-interest, we work for it. And in the bargain, what happens? The economy also gets stimulated. There is more wealth created in the society. And that is the reason why students, he supported the concept of free market, free from all sorts of regulations, wherein the traders are free to work they, the way they want. So this is called as a free market according to Adam Smith. So students, this was the economic perspective on markets. Now we will go to the sociological perspectives. Now sociologists view markets as social institutions that are constructed in a culturally specific way. For example, markets are often controlled by particular groups or classes. If you see, most of the markets are controlled by certain groups of individuals, like we have the Salgaonkas, we have the Tatas, we have the Billas, and so many other groups. So basically, the entire market is controlled by these business communities or by these particular classes or the groups. Sociologists often express the idea by saying that economies are socially embedded they are fixed in the society within the social groups. Next very important topic, students, is the weekly tribal market in Dorai village of Bastar district of Chhattisgarh. In this topic, we are going to learn about weekly tribal markets with special reference to the market at Dorai in Chhattisgarh. Before we go further, I would like to show you some pictures of weekly markets in Goa or the periodic markets in Goa. They are not every day, but only on a particular day of the week we have these markets. Right in front of us, we have a picture of the Saturday night market at Arpora, which takes place on a Saturday. Next, we have a picture of the Friday Mapsa market people selling some sausages, some pottery. Again, this is also a picture or an image of the Friday market at Mapsa. Next, we have the Anjuna flea market, which takes place on a Wednesday. So these are some images or pictures of weekly markets in Goa. Now we shall proceed, we shall see what is the benefit of these weekly markets? What do they do? Weekly markets bring together people from the surrounding villages who come to sell their agricultural and other produce and also to buy goods that they do not have with them in their villages. These markets attract traders, moneylenders, astrologers, entertainers and many other people. Now the weekly hut or the periodic markets as we call them, they are a common site students in rural as well as in urban area. If you see now many places we have these weekly markets. I've mentioned some to you all, but besides that, 
there are many other markets in Goa and even the other parts of our country, both in rural as well as in urban areas. Now, there is a primary reason or there is a main reason why people come to these markets. Usually when we say market, people come for their economic benefits. But here, in these markets, people usually come for their social benefits. They come to meet their friends, their relatives. They come to arrange marriages. They come to gossip and so on. Now, one of the most important example, a very good example of this weekly market is the weekly market at the Dorai village of Chhattisgarh. Now at this market, students, tribals as well as non-tribals and also the other forest officials come to conduct business with the Adivasis. Some of the major goods that are exchanged in this market are the manufactured goods such as pots, jewelry, trinkets, then non-local foods such as salt, haldi, etc. Some people even come with their baskets or some craft which they do at home. So these are the things that are sold in the weekly tribal market of the Dorai village. Now according to Alfred Gell, the market has significance beyond its economic functions. We usually know market has got economic functions. But he says that these markets the functions are beyond the economic ones, okay? It goes beyond economic means it has got some social functions also. Now he speaks about the layout of the market that symbolizes the hierarchical intergroup social relations in this region. The wealthy and the high ranking Rajput dwellers and the middle ranking Hindu traders, they sit in the central zones whereas the tribal sellers of vegetables and other things set in the outer circles. Let me just show you a small diagram of the layout of the weekly tribal market at Dorai. If you see their students in the middle circles, circle there, you will have the wealthy Rajput dwellers and the middle ranking traders. And in the outer circles, we have the tribal vegetable sellers and the sellers of the local ways. Now we shall see the quality of social relations that were expressed in these tribal areas. So the quality of social relation expressed was in the kind of goods that are bought and sold and the way in which transactions were carried out. They expressed hierarchy and there was social distance. They went on the caste the tribals and the non-tribal, there was a difference between them. There was no equality as traders. They always showed differences between the tribal and the non-tribal traders. Now, these weekly market students had a lot of negative effects on the Adivasis, on the tribals. So let us see how the entry of traders and money lenders from outside the local areas led to the impoverishment of the Adivasis. So first of all, the opening of the tribal areas by the colonial rulers led to the influx of traders, money lenders and other non-tribals. More and more people entered into the tribal areas. Now because of this, students, the local tribal economy was transformed. Money and new kinds of good entered into the system. The tribals were recruited as laborers in plantations, in mines. Due to all these changes, the tribal economy became linked to the wider markets with negative consequences for the local people. So what are these negative consequences? First of all, when these traders, the non-tribal, entered into the tribal areas, they, some of them settled there and they took away the lands belonging to the tribals. So the lands were taken away. These people did not have any land left for themselves. Now another 
thing what happened is there was a dilution of the tribal culture. The tribal culture got eroded. So these are some of the negative effects or the ne negative consequences of the non-tribal areas from outside coming into the tribal areas. Therefore, students, we can say that the entry of these traders and money lenders from outside the local area led to the impoverishment of the Adivasis. Now we shall move on to our next topic, which is also very important, students. Caste-based markets and trading networks in pre-colonial and colonial India. As we know, students, India was into trade for a, quite a long time, even before the British came to India. We had traders like the Dutch, the Portuguese, the French, all coming to India for trading purpose. That means the trading system was going on even before the colonial rule started in India. But it was assumed, students, that the ancient village communities were relatively self-sufficient and their economies were organized primarily on the basis of non-market exchange systems. Now, what is that non-market exchange? Non-market exchange, like maybe the Bata system, where things or goods were exchanged for goods or services for exchange for goods or services for exchange for services. That was the barter system. So it was assumed that these people were only self-sufficient and they used the non-market exchange systems. Yes, non-market exchange system like the judgment system did exist in the pre-colonial period. Now here, what is judgment system? We have two categories of people. One is the judgments and one is the prajans. Now the judgments were the landlords and the prajans were the service caste. The judgments were served by the prajans and in return they would be paid either in cash or kind. Now this judgment system students was hereditary in nature. Means what? Means after the death of a prajan, his son or sons had to serve the sons of the judgment. Okay. Now, pre-colonial India also had well-organized manufacturing centers as well as indigenous merchant groups, trading networks and banking systems that enable trade to take place within India and also between India and the rest of the world. So indigenous merchant groups were there during the pre-colonial period. These traditional trading communities had their own system of banking and credit. For example, an important instrument of exchange and credit was the hundi or the bill of exchange. Now let us see what hundi actually means. Now hundi, as I have already said, is an important instrument of exchange and credit. It was also called as the bill of exchange. Now, Kundi allowed merchants to engage in long distance trade. A merchant in one part of the country could issue a Hundi to another merchant in another part of the country. For example, we have the DD, we have the checks. When we buy certain products, we issue a check or we issue a DD and give it to that person and then it is credited into that person's account. So same thing was done with the hundi. So hundi was actually a credit note. Now in this traditional business communities, we shall learn about one very important community that is the Natukotai Chetiyas or the Nakaratars of Tamil Nadu. Now these trading communities or caste had their own system of banking and credit. Example I have already given, Hundi or the bill of exchange. The banking and trading activities of the Natukotai Chetiyas of Tamil Nadu were deeply embedded in their social organization. Means they were fixed in their own societies, in their own communities. The Nakaratar banks, they loaned and deposited money with one another in a caste-defined social relationship. They would give loans to people from their own community. People would deposit in their banks. 
only people belonging to that particular community would usually deposit money into the banks. Now, these Nakaratar banks were basically joint family firms. All the families got together and they started these banks. Similarly, trading and banking activities were organized through caste and kinship relationship. Everything was based on caste and kinship relationship. It may be banking, it may be trading activities, everything was on kinship and caste relationship. The extensive caste-based social networks allowed the Chetiyar merchants to expand their activity into Southeast Asia as well as Ceylon, that is the present day Sri Lanka. So they had a wide network, people were spread all over. So because of this social network of their students, these people were able to expand their business activities, expand their business. Next important topic is the social organization of markets. Now there's a close connection students between the caste system and the economy of the nation. And the same is also true in the case of trade and market. When we learnt about the features of caste, one of the features of caste is, caste is linked to occupation. A particular caste has to follow a particular occupation. That means there is a close connection between the caste and the occupation. The caste and the economy of the nation. Okay. Now, the very important community was the Vaisha community, one of the four Varnas, which in fact is an indication of the importance of merchants, of trade and business in the Indian society. Now, the Vaisha communities such as the Banyas in North India, whose traditional occupation has been trade and commerce for a long time, the word Banyas, here maybe in Goa we may not know about the banyas, but if you go to places like Bombay and all, usually the word is very common. Even a small child will tell who a banya is. Because everywhere we have shops, especially grocery shops belonging to the banyas. Now, as we said, banyas and the Vaisha community we also know that Vaisha community was the, not the only community who had the traditional business. There were other communities belonging to other religion also who were into business. They were also the traditional business communities. We have examples such as the Jains, the Parsis, the Boras, the Sindhis and so many others. I hope it is clear, students. Next, we go to colonialism and the emergence of new markets. Very important topic, students. Now, colonialism, when we hear the word colonialism, we know that because of colonialism, we face a lot of problems, face a lot of difficulties in all the fields. It may be trading, it may be market, it may be agriculture. Everywhere there were a lot of problems which the Indian society faced. Now the advent of colonialism or the coming in of colonialism produced major upheavals in the Indian economy. There was a disruption in production, trade and agriculture. A well-known example is the demise of the handloom industry due to the flooding of cheap manufactured textiles from England. Students, we know when the colonial rule, the British used to take the raw materials from India to England, convert them into finished products, bring it here and sell it to us at a very cheap rate, especially textiles. So people would definitely prefer the cheap materials, the cheap clothes compared to the handloom industry. So what will happen to the handloom industry? It had to be shut down. So there was a demise of the handloom industry. Second consequence or second bad effect of colonialism is that during the colonial era, 
India began to be more fully linked to the world capitalist economy. She became the source of raw material and agricultural product and a consumer of manufactured goods. Supplier or a source of raw materials and we only consumed what was manufactured by the British. Now during this time, during the colonial period, new groups entered into trade and business expansion of markets. Economy in India provided new opportunities to some merchant communities which were able to improve their position by reorienting themselves to the changing circumstances. The best example is the Marwari community. We must have all heard about the Marwari community. But let us see in detail about the Marwari community. The Marwaris were the most widespread and best known business communities in India. This community represented by leading industrial families such as the Billas, the Bajaj, the Agarwals, etc. They became more successful only during the colonial period. We have many example students where Marwaris are the owners of big companies. We have Bajaj Auto, then we have Lupin Pharmaceuticals, then we have Seat Tires, we have Idea Cellular, Z Entertainment, all these are run by the Marwari communities, the big industrialists who belong to these Marwari community. Now the Marwaris took advantage of the new opportunities in colonial cities such as Calcutta and settled throughout the country to carry trade and money lending. First they started with small business, they accumulated money and then they became big businessmen. If you see students all around us, the market is mostly dominated by the Marwaris. Now, why were these Marwaris successful? It is said the success of the Marwaris rested on the extensive social networks which created a relation of trust necessary to operate their banking systems. We have seen in the Natukotai Chetiyas also, they were successful because of their wide network, social networks, the relation of trust. For any business, for any activity, students, if we want it to be successful, there has to be a relation of trust. And that was there among the Marwaris, which helped them a lot. If you see, many of the Marwari shops, they usually keep their own people to work. Why? Because there is a relation of trust among these people. Now, they accumulated enough wealth. As I said, they took the opportunities during the colonial period. Maybe they just started with a small business and they accumulated a lot of money. And then later they became money lenders, they became bankers. And now I give you many examples. We know that they are the top industrialists in our country. Students will go to the our next topic that is understanding capitalism as a social system. Here we shall stress on the concept of commodification or commoditization. Now what is commodification or what is commoditization? The process where things that were earlier not traded as commodities or things have now become a part of the market economy is called as commodification or commoditization. For instance, labor and skills have become things that can be bought and sold. Skills like somebody may be good in dancing. So that person usually sells how he may start a coaching class, a dance class where he can teach children dancing. So he is selling his skills. So skills are bought and sold. We also have many private institutions offering courses in personality development, spoken English and so on. 
When I say personality development, when we were young, our parents would tell us which dress would look nice or which lipstick to wear or what makeup to put. But now we have courses where they teach us all these things. We have courses in spoken English. We usually learned English in schools or maybe when uh, parents spoke at home, we learned from them. But now we have classes, private institution, coaching people in spoken English and so on. Drinking water students is another example of commodification. Easily we get the drinking water in bottles now, which would not happen some years back. If we were thirsty, we would just stop as we were passing and uh, ask for water from someone, from someone's house. But now water is easily available in the shops and we buy from there and we drink. So there is commodification of this water. Another example, students, of commodification of culture is the famous camel fair at Pushkar in Rajasthan. It is the biggest camel fair, students. I would like to show a picture of this camel fair. If you look at this, one side, you see there are so many camels brought there to be sold at this fair. And on the other side, we have tourist taking ride on this camel. So culture is being commodified. Coaching classes is again another example of commodification of education. Small children of even KG are sent for tuitions. When they can be very well taught at home, they are sent. So education is become a commodity now. Earlier students' marriages were arranged by our relatives, our family members, our neighbors maybe. But now there are marriage bureaus, there are websites, there are matchmakers who arrange the partners for us by paying or we give a lot of money to these matchmakers. Then we have the wedding planners who plan everything for us. Right from maybe even looking out for a partner till the honeymoon, the gown, the catering, everything is taken care of by these wedding planners. We have event managers, a small party, we give it to the event manager who take care of everything. Now this commodification student has got some negative effects. So what are the negative effects? Now according to Karl Marx, he says there are some negative social effects of commodification. Example, the commodification of labor. Then the contemporary examples are that of the controversy about the sale of kidneys by the poor people to cater to the rich patients who need kidney transplant. Doctors also, without even informing the patient, poor patient, they take out the kidneys and sell them at a very high price. So this is all commodified, or these are all examples, students, of commodification. Students, with this, I come to the end of my explanation part. I would just stress on some questions, likely questions from this topic. First, we have the objective types. First, I have the most famous political economist, Adam Smith, wrote the book called The Wealth of the Nation. Then. Adam Smith supported the idea of free market or laissez-faire. Next we have the famous camel fair in Pushkar, Rajasthan is an example of commodification of culture. Coaching classes is an example of commodification of education. Now these can be asked as uh, fill in the blanks or complete the following 
multiple choice type or it can be asked as one mark question. Next we have during the colonial period the most successful business community was the Marwari. Then the best example of indigenous trading networks in Tamil Nadu were the Natukotai Chetiyas or the Nakarathas. The sale of kidneys by the poor is an example of commodification. Then we have during the colonial rule, the long distance trade in salt was controlled by the marginalized tribal groups called as the Banjaras. These are some of the questions, students. In what way is the market such as the weekly tribal market a social institution? Or explain the significance of the Dorai village market. Another way it can be asked is explain the quality of social relations that has been expressed in the weekly tribal market of Dorai village. Next we have show how money entry of traders and money lenders from outside the local area led to the impoverishment of the Adivasis. Next, explain the trading networks in pre-colonial and colonial India. What is Hundi? Now this question can be asked as one mark or a two mark question. Analyze the Natukotai Chetiyas as traditional business communities. Next, explain how caste and kin network contribute to the success of business. Next question we have, explain the social organization of the traditional business communities in India. Then we have, in what ways did the Indian economy change after the coming in of colonialism? Or it can be also asked in another way, explain the ill effects of colonialism on trade or market. Or the advent of colonialism in India produced major upheavals in the economy, explain. Then we have explain the success of Marwari communities during the colonial period or the Marwaris were the widespread and the best known business communities in India. Explain. Next we have what is commodification with examples and the last what are the negative social effects of commodification. With this students, I come to the end of this sociology lecture. I hope all of you all have understood. Thank you so much. Stay home, stay safe. Prudent Scholars, powered by Lupin Pharmaceuticals.